Hey guys, welcome to the 97th episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, storytelling, and directing. I'm Oren Kaplan. And I'm Matt Enlow. Today we have Pat Bishop on. Pat directed every single episode of the new Comedy Central series, Corporate, which is awesome and incredible and I recommend everyone check out. But even if you haven't seen the show yet, he's got a ton of really interesting insight on directing the first season of his television show. He started out just kind of like everybody else, making internet videos. He had a great sketch team um, and now he is helming and created a, a TV show with a really specific visual style and flair and a great comedic point of view. So it's a really interesting conversation about how to implement that point of view into a corporate structure. Yeah, uh, talking to Pat was awesome. He's, like Matt said, you know, has a background in web video. He used to do a bunch of stuff for Funny or Die. And, you know, I think it's, it's a story we've heard many times before. A comedian slash editor ends up getting a TV show. It, it was really fun talking to him because he is a guy that has always kind of done everything himself and this is the first time that he had like a giant crew and it's really fun just hearing you know I think something a lot of our listeners have experienced or will experience is just making that transition from being responsible for everything to having this giant team and how to manage that that stuff so I think you guys are really going to enjoy this yeah I, I certainly did um, yeah I love those aha moments of like oh yeah I don't have to wake up at 5am anymore um, so yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a really great thing. But before we talk to Pat, we wanted to let you guys know that we got a sponsor for our show. Uh, it's a company called Film Casualty. We liked them as a sponsor because they have a service that would cater to our listeners. They provide insurance for filmmakers. And I think Matt and my first instinct was like, hmm, insurance is pretty boring. What, you know, what is interesting about it? And so we, um, so we challenged the CEO of Film Casualty, Cameron Woodward, to talk to us about why filmmakers should care about insurance. And uh, for the next few episodes, we're going to play different segments uh, from our interviews with him. So hopefully you'll enjoy it. Yeah, we figured if we're going to do a sponsorship, it's got to be something that's going to bring additional value to our listeners, uh, like educational value to our listeners, regardless of whether or not they end up actually using the service. Um, so we'd love to hear what you think about them. We're pretty proud of them. I think they're like cool pieces of content that we would air otherwise anyway. You know, I've certainly all of the questions we asked came from the heart because I don't know anything about insurance and I know a little bit more now. Yeah, I know a ton more now. So here's our first sponsorship segment from Film Casualty. We sat down with our friend Cameron from Film Casualty to talk a little bit more about the ins and outs of insurance and how the fine folks at Film Casualty could help us out. Is there any kind of insurance, like let's say I'm directing a commercial for someone and I'm taking some big risks creatively and then they end up hating the commercial and not wanting to air it? happened to me many times. <laughs> That's actually a really, really good question. So uh, oftentimes in a general liability policy, there is coverage to protect against a lawsuit arising in the effect that a client says that the product or service that you provided uh, was faulty. And so in many cases, this is one of the best reasons to even hold insurance is to protect yourself against third parties coming after you for who knows why. Oftentimes, simply holding an insurance policy can protect you from some really scary legal fees that might be around the corner. For more information about how to protect your film business, gear, project, and crew, go to filmcasualty.com slash just shoot it. That's filmcasualty.com slash just shoot it. Insurance for every kind of filmmaker. Great. So without further ado, now we are going to jump into our interview with Pat Bishop. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, yeah, Matt told me about you, and then he said, dude, I just watched Corporate. It's, like, really, really good. You got to watch it. Yeah. So great. Everybody go watch it. Um, Pat, you were the director on the entire season. Yes. Um, did you block shoot? Like, tell us about that oh, a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So we shot the pilot uh, first before they picked up the rest of the series. Um, uh, and then, yeah, we shot nine at, uh, back-to-back, basically. And, uh, yeah, for the sake of efficiency we really sure. went nuts with it uh there's i think one day we shot scenes from eight different episodes oh boy that's <laughs> wild man did yeah. you do you try to just pick something up from the ninth episode just so 
you can feel <laughs> just like to complete. Impress yeah. Yourself. No, I don't think we even noticed until it's like this seems like a lot of episodes that we're covering right. today. Was it, it was just reaction shots from like one character. <laughs> <laughs> there were like lots of um, cold opens or like montages where mm-hmm. we needed like a shot in like twenty different locations. So right. throughout the like shooting schedule, we like we're shooting a, a shot for that montage again today sure. for the tenth time. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Actually, to just dive deep right away, how do you? I'm working on this show right now, and it, part of the thing we're trying to balance is, like, number of locations, right? The production company is like, get the locations down, but you want to give, like, scope to your show, right? You don't want the whole thing to take place in one location. So how do you kind of balance that? Do, do you, is there, like, some sort of formula or structure where you're like, I want to I wanna see, like, at least five locations per episode? Or, or how, how do you yeah, think about it that way? Especially, just to kind of set the table for the listeners a little bit, corporate, uh, most of it is in a corporate office right 90 percent of the show right so it's like it's cubicles yeah, it's little, and boardrooms and stuff like that yeah the later episodes we go to the office more and that was the thing we wanted to have a balance of because it's it's a workplace sort of comedy but it's also about a corporation that makes everything so you right. need to see what it's like for the employees who work there but you also need to see how the kind of small things they're doing are affecting the larger world right, right. um so we needed that balance and i think it what it did make it possible for us to shoot very efficiently by shooting and we shot in the la times building uh oh, cool. downtown which oh, is cool. uh they they have entire floors that are empty now sure, because of yeah. the fall of journalism uh, <laughs> you have <laughs> so this you beautiful just, high rise <laughs> yeah, yeah so assume. we could and it really had a lot to offer of kind of just like mm-hmm. these great sort of like standing sets essentially um so we could get a lot of different looks out of that building mm-hmm. um and still be uh moving efficiently but yeah, we had to at a certain point like get outside and go to a park sure. and <laughs> shoot some stuff so yeah. the audience wouldn't feel totally oppressed by that. I think it's in our show too, like in the writing, we try to make every episode different and we try to like go somewhere in the show. So it's not just like a sitcom where you mm-hmm. you have the, you know, Jerry's apartment and right. the like <laughs> diner. You, you want to go somewhere visually in the show. Um, and that does, yeah, it takes extra time and i think especially like even setups within like a single location was even more of the thing of getting all the shots i wanted i had to cut shots all the time sure you know a thing that i I realize um in hearing that it's in a basically a practical location makes sense there's a lot of ceiling in your show in a way that made it feel real and oppressive and cool looking you Mm -hmm. know you know, oftentimes you don't get to see a ceiling because there isn't one. <laughs> you yep. know what I mean? So, yeah. Um, That's like Mad Men. Everyone's like, would always talk about the ceiling shots because it's like ever present, you know, in, in every scene. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, we try to take advantage of what we had and, and kind of took the thing of like, just give us a location that's real and we'll figure out ways uh-huh. to shoot and make it interesting versus constructing something that you have to give set specifications for. Right. Just kind of, I, I feel like I'd always take the, the choice of like, give me a, a big field to kind of play with. Yeah. I I think also maybe coming from the internet and like from kind of a more scrappy indie DIY place, I think I don't want to speak for everybody else, but I feel very comfortable going into a location and figuring out what makes that location special, you know? Yeah. And I think that, um, when we graduate up to TV, sometimes you get overwhelmed with choices when it's like, okay, well I'm building a set. So what color do I want this wall to be? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I've said for years I shot just like web videos and things with, um, uh, I was in a sketch group called Women with uh, Jake Weissman from corporate as well as uh, Dave Ross and Alan Strickland Williams. Um, and we shot the vast majority of our sketches in one of our apartments <laughs> right, and had to right. like make it uh, interesting. But I, th- I think like we could still find a way to do that. And yeah, be, you have to be more resourceful. Right, yeah. yeah. Resourceful. Do you think there's any director's in the world that prefers to shoot on a set than on a loca- like on location, yeah, because you can yeah. control everything. You can take the walls away, and there was we sh- the main kind of actual location we had was Matt and Jake's office, which was uh-huh. we were like we pick we got to pick a small room so it feels like these guys are trapped in right. this uh, small office together. And then it was like a nightmare to shoot in there because sure. we had two cameras in there, <laughs> right? And had to anytime we wanted to get a shot from the back of the room, it's we had to take all the furniture out, right, and move it and get to get the cameras back there. So yeah. it would have been nice to have removable walls. Yeah. That that is a, a location specifically that would have been pretty easy to build. Yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> season two maybe. Yeah. Well they had to shoot some promos and it's a totally different crew and they shot it later and they just rebuilt 
<laughs> that <sad. laughs> really? like, well, no, this is kind of <laughs> nice actually yeah. well you know in that movie <laughs> room the room room the um, just brie room. larson yeah. movie that they they built that room on a sta- on a stage and they built it a lot bigger than it was described in the book because they exactly what you're saying we want to be able to move around and shoot and they felt like it just felt too big um and so they like made it way smaller and the walls were still removable but um sometimes like forcing yourself into that cramped space like I, i've shot like a dorm room before and the production designer built it really big like it was the size of four dorm rooms yeah and when you're shooting it, it feels like the actors are like far away from each other, you know, and they're each sitting on their bed. So there's something about like really shooting in a small space that's, that's yeah. helpful. I feel like I'm still learning how much you can like uh, fake things. Or you can build a set and make something look like that. That's not actually right. what it is. I'm so used to starting of like, well, just make it look yeah. like what we want it to look. It's like, no, you need to build a whole thing and then we can control it. Right. And, make it look like an awesome version of two people <laughs> sitting at a table talking to each other. Right. I guess when you're building sets, now that I think about it, it is kind of hard, like Matt saying, like you talk to your production designer and you can do anything you want. So you're like, well, we need these four walls and this door. And like, we'll put a bed here. But like, if instead of doing that, like thinking what you need, but actually going out to like real locations and saying like, oh, there's a weird built-in shelf here. This window right. is awkward. That inspires a weird joke. And all, all of a sudden it becomes a runner and like, yeah, you so know, I guess before your talking, show is about the weird shelf. Yeah. yeah, before talking to the production designer, you should go see like how weird places right. look. Yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, we'll just be building boxes and shooting boxed stuff. Yeah. I'll look like Minecraft. Yes. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, this is my first TV show, so there are all these kind of like parts of the process that I'd never gotten to do the right way before, like uh-huh. location scouting and. Uh, casting and all these different things that I have tried to learn about and be a student of and how to take advantage of it. And now I feel like I know more how to like search for locations or I'm more hungry to like, Mm -hmm. let's look at a hundred places and find the coolest location. Whereas before I'm used to like, just, well, where can, are we allowed to shoot? (laughs) Only one option. Okay, (laughs) Okay, cool. (laughs) Let's do it in my apartment. What, um, besides locations, were there other things in particular that you kind of, um, found, interesting or like you know working with a bigger crew uh than i ever had before um i realized just how much the kind of chain reaction that would occur with any decision i would make or any Mm -hmm. change i would make kind of last minute um and how because i would see kind of the camera crew and the actors and kind of the immediate stuff but there's this whole infrastructure Mm -hmm. um surrounding it there's like the makeup team is off on their mm-hmm. own and like production design has people like in the office working on stuff for next week but also people like costumes are out shopping there's all this stuff kind of going on especially when you're shooting a tv show like multiple weeks of production back to back it needs to be this sort of machine that has these different ongoing right. processes right. and how many weeks did you shoot the nine episodes in uh eight weeks so okay. we had like, like four ep- uh four days per episode and um, there are 22 minutes yep mm-hmm uh, which was not enough time. Yeah, that's pretty fast. <laughs> but yeah. I hear is standard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, four days. I. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think now. I mean, for a sitcom, you could, they shoot them in a week, right? But yeah, or so that's so different. Six days, sometimes I want to say. Like, so you you kind of float a little bit. I don't know. I'm sure, like a Last Man on Earth probably gets like eight to ten days per episode. Yeah. What yeah. do you think? But I'm trying to I'm trying to think of how many days. We, but I bet a broad city. Yeah, it would but, be like four days. Yeah, yeah they're probably. probably the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I was gonna say it's so funny that you mentioned like the chain reaction part because I feel like that's a common thing we hear on the show of like when it's you and your friends in an apartment, you just you decide to flip the room again real quick, and it's the equivalent of you moving a camera. It's not a big deal, right? Yeah. Like you can kind of like be a little bit more of an artiste about it, but then. If that means that 30 people have to move all of their gear back and forth, (laughs) you know, that's a tiny microcosm of what you're talking about. But like, yeah. And I feel like, too, I'm trying to learn to resist the urge of like, well, don't make it so complicated. Just do it the like fast and like half assed way. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I've got and we hired like um, a cinematographer who um, is this uh, like French guy in his like fifties who's done like uh, uh-huh. a lot of commercials and, and uh, features and that sort of thing. So we had this kind of like very 
kind of high standards uh-huh. for everything. And that's yeah, yeah. that's what we wanted too. And what and wanted him to kind of augment uh, our like just comedy video background mm-hmm. by making everything look good. But so he he had these kind of rules of like what we had if we were gonna do something, it had to look good. Uh-huh. So I couldn't like just cheat or like cut corners yeah, the way I'm like, like used to. Dude, come on, just 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 <laughs> Get that shot real quick, yeah. please. Yeah, pan yeah. over and just can you get yeah. her? And yeah, he'll be like, she's over. not lit. Just yeah. zoom in and pan over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> like, no. Uh, that's so funny. Um, so you shot two cameras? Yeah. Two Alexas? Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, I was going to say, I remember on a, a show I just did, the AD said something that I'll always remember. He said, you have to get used to asking people to do things they don't want to do. Right. And there's there's like a little bit of like a nice guy and a, like a roll with the punches sort of mentality that I think we probably have of like, you know, like, well, it's another way of cutting a corner. Right. Like, mm-hmm. you you know, in the back of your head, oh, maybe it would be better if we did it this way. But we're kind of behind and, you know, we'd I'd ha- we would cause all these problems. So I'm not going to ask for that thing. And like learning when you mean it, when you do want to actually ask for the thing or or not. I think is like that is a part of the growing pain of of leveling up, I guess. Yeah, definitely. And I, I feel too like directing, I was constantly just solving problems or like people would present, here's an obstacle to this. And sometimes there wouldn't be a solution or the solution as well. Just do it anyway. <laughs> like we got to yeah. go. And I yeah. think because I'm sort of like, they're all day stressed out, you know, right. like, so I know I'm in this kind of hurried state all day, but somebody like an actor comes on for their scene or something. And like, this is all they have to do for the right. day. And sometimes you have to, there's a conflict in conveying to somebody like, no, we got to, we're behind. Yeah, like, yeah. We got to get this, <laughs> your yeah. thing. That's just be funny. Go. Yeah. The, the, uh, so important to you. It's just one of a hundred things I got to do. Today. Right. Well, right. that's the thing I've been working on lately, which is telling actors that are there for like one line or for one quick thing to say like, Hey, just so you know, you're like you're super important to us. Your your work is really important. We're like running behind, so we might only do one or two takes. If you need another one, let me know. But if I move, if I'm moving on, it means that I loved what you did, yeah. And the client right. loved what you did, and that's it. So don't be offended. Because <laughs> I try know? to be sympathetic to those people too, because they're sitting around all day, and sure. then it's like there's like one moment where it's like everyone's looking at them. There's all these lights <laughs> shining, yeah. and, and it's like okay, go. Yeah, nail yeah. it and it's it's high pressure just yeah after sitting around and waiting for so long especially and, yeah. if you're not a series regular like everyone else knows each other and like all of a sudden you you've got the one line you yeah. know you this is probably like a, a relatively big break you know like this is an opportunity and then the stars of the shows are you know having a good time and everybody knows each other and then yeah everyone looks at you and you get three chances to do it and that's that yeah and you know you got to call your mom afterwards and tell her how it went and yeah, it's like... Yeah, and I'm not, like, ever worried about... I never, like, judge anyone. It's just like, we'll just do it until we get it. So right, for me, it's sure. like this kind of, like, you know, it's fine. If you screw up, it's fine. We'll just roll again, yeah, do it yeah. right away. So I try to put people at ease, but I... I yeah, people... <laughs> yeah, sure. They're like, oh, I, I worked with this actor years ago that while we were working together and booked this TV show, um, and he he was, like, a regular on it, and he told me, like, on the TV show, it was so different because... He said if like the dolly move, the focus and the timing was like perfect, then they would move on. And he's like, so I have to like on the very first take, I have to bring it. I have to do my best performance always because I know if like technically everything is right, they they don't want, they're not going to give, let, let me play around with it. Yeah. That was another tricky thing in, in the sort of aesthetic of our mm-hmm. show. We we use kind of like a shallow depth of field. Sure. Uh, yeah. And we have kind of specific camera moves, dollies mostly versus just a looser handheld yeah. sort of thing. So it is very precise. And I have to like, you have to nail everything down in blocking mm-hmm. and you have to kind of limit the actor's abilities to improvise. And, and, our, and our main cast understood that uh, and just got sure. used to it. But when guest stars would come in too, it'd sometimes be a little... Tricky, That's or they really start improving or something. I'm like, "That's really funny," but honestly, it's completely unusable. I can't use it. Oh, yeah. that's so if, interesting. If you don't, if my camera operator doesn't know what you're going to do, it's not going to work. Yeah, and sort of the yeah, just but that's the aesthetic we chose, and it's it pays off. Sure, by looking cool. Yeah, yeah, but it looks you have great. To be more disciplined and looks special for sure. And I want to talk more about how you guys arrived on that, um, but it, it is really. I'm, my mind is a little blown because, like, of course, you're hiring super funny people, like, out of the same kind of comedy community that you've been working in for a long time. And so it's very in vogue right now to be prepared to improvise a little bit and play and have fun. And there's two cameras rolling, right? So you kind of, 
an actor would immediately think part of their job is like, hey, you know, add a little extra flavor. And the less lines they have, the more they want to like impress you. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so yeah, interesting. I think it's a balance because on the one hand, you don't want things to be too stiff. You want to have those kind of moments that feel off the cuff. Mm-hmm. And especially with the kind of like show that's very kind of um, specific in its visual style and the camera moves are choreographed. You want things that feel like the camera wasn't expecting it to happen, uh-huh. you know, to yeah. get that spontaneity. Um, but at the same time, like I think from a comedic perspective too, we're not people who like to improv a lot and let the silly actors be uh-huh. funny. There's like an overall vision that each actor is kind of fitting into. I see. Um, so it was sometimes good to sort of like have to limit people, yeah. even just for, we had technical excuses sure. to like <laughs> give them from what we we're doing. But also, yeah, it, sometimes I wondered, yeah, if I should like explain to actors who just came on for a uh-huh. day, it's like, so here's what we do here. Yeah, we take yeah. comedy very seriously <laughs> and we right. don't screw around. But there's also like, you know, I, so I haven't seen as much of your show as Matt has seen, but I've seen uh, a little bit of it. And there does seem to be like a rhythm and like a specificity and like people aren't like mumbling around and stuff. Mm-hmm. So when you have that rhythm and someone's improvising and adding like three endings to the scene, you're like, well, I only need one ending and now I don't know where to cut because you just wouldn't stop talking yeah. at the end. I also, yeah, I'm very involved in the editing as well and come from an editing background. So I also try to not bullshit people. It's mm-hmm. like, honestly, I'm not going to use any of that and it's going to be my decision. So <laughs> I try to be honest with people or like if they're going to improvise, set them up so that I will use it. Sure. Yeah. But not just placate people. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, so let's, funny. so let's rewind a little bit. So uh, when you are the writer, director, partial editor, yeah. <laughs> creator and producer of the show. Uh, yeah, so I, I created the show with uh, Matt Ingham, Bretton, and Jake Weissman, who are the two uh, stars of the show. And uh, yeah, we together developed it. We we wrote it and ran a writer's room. Uh, and then, yeah, I directed the season. And yeah, we were all involved. We're executive producers, so we're, we're kind of the like, yeah, creative uh, head in the uh, editing and kind of just in general. You're the boss of the show. Yeah. yeah. Are you the showrunner? Uh, uh, we wrote, we had, uh, Jake Vogelnest, uh, was our showrunner for mm-hmm. season one and, uh, helped, uh, run the writer's room, uh, mostly. And we, uh, just wrote a season two that we're hoping to be oh, allowed to nice. shoot, uh, where Matt, Jake and I, uh, ran the show. Gotcha. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. You guys wrote the entire season without being greenlit for it? Yep. <laughs> oh, wow. How long bit, did that take? Uh, three months. Yeah. Unpaid? No, we get, we got paid. So they are at least they've Oh, they bought the script but they haven't greenlit the season? Yes. Is that so, normal? Um we they delayed the release of the show, I think just for their own programming mm-hmm. reasons, so that they needed I think to keep us uh like contr- for contractual reasons needed to like pull the trigger on at least some phase of it. Got it. Earlier. And they also were just very supportive of us and liked the show and it's a, it's sure. a vote of confidence. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. So, yeah. but yeah, it will be absolutely devastating if uh, <laughs> you don't get to shoot it. So, when you're on set, do you like are the Comedy Central people there, and are you do you have to get them to approve like big changes you decide to make on the spot? Uh, no, they they would be there sometimes, but um, no, pretty much left us alone. And um, so, if the scene's not working, you can just rewrite it there. You can tell someone to do something different. Like you kind of have all the power to do whatever you want. Yeah, and it and it was good that. Matt, Jake, and I are the main parts of it, and I'm the director, they're the two actors. So it was very easy to like change things and right. not have to go check with anyone. It's right. like we can You're the out and make our own yeah. decisions yeah. too. So um, yeah, it was good to have that sort of consolidation of the kind of uh, creative decision making. Yeah. And, and so uh, going back to the the look and feel and style of the show, right? It's very controlled. It's very specific. It's not um, what you think a comedy looks like right now. Do you know? It's not bubblegum at all. Like you said, it's very sh- shallow depth the field, controlled camera move. It's very cool. So how did you communicate that to the network? And was that part of the pitch? Like w- when did that style kind of come come to be? It was in its sort of broad strokes was right there from the beginning and something that Matt, Jake, and I collectively sort of felt. We wanted it to look different from other comedy. We wanted it to feel darker, kind of mm-hmm. like a David Fincher. Sure, uh, yeah, I was going to say it looks like a Fincher movie, Yeah, but and funnier. I, 
<laughs> and I think um, there's a, yeah, just sort of default in comedy to make it brighter and with brighter colors so that it feels fun and kind of happy. And that was just kind of specifically at odds with the point of our show, <laughs> uh, which is that it's a depressing work environment. So we tried to be extremely upfront with what we were going to doing because it is it, it looks different from other comedies. And um, but I think the other thing is that we're all fans of uh, movies and feel that comedy a lot of times doesn't try as hard as it could to use cinematic techniques or um, just look good and interesting. And so we tried to, in the writing phase, to uh, infuse that into the script and like, you know, because you can't just slap a visual style on top of a script that sure. wasn't thought of in that way. It needs to be integrated uh, into that. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's really what we wanted to bring to a comedy is a sort of more cinematic sensibility. That's cool. I've thought about that a lot because you kind of think when you mix comedy with like cinematic, like highly stylized cinematic um, aesthetics, it's usually a parody, right? Yeah. Like the Key and Peele stuff, which was like oh, a lot of it looked amazing, but it was there like making fun of a genre or something. Yeah, because you kind of, it's taking it seriously. Because I think there's some of that to a cover too. If it's kind of handheld and just fun, it's like, oh, they just hung out with those people and made those jokes. But if it's like this, like, uh, lit in a very specific way and with a camera move it's like they're very serious about this stupid thing that this guy's saying uh, which I think sometimes can be the joke almost if the if it's comedic lines it's the joke is almost how hard we work to make it look good right. for right. that stupid joke sure. well how do you think like Edgar Wright style fits into the this conversation. Yeah, I think it's very similar in the way he kind of like accentuates things and sort of dips into genre parody a bit, kind of at ease in a fluid way. Um, and that I think it's... Because uh, his stuff is like really bright and poppy, but it's also super specific and visual. You know? Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, it's I, like his own thing. Yeah, what I admire about him is he really makes things pop uh, through... Uh, yeah, cinematic techniques that other people aren't doing. But what I think, yeah, what I think maybe I would have a criticism about like Baby Driver, for instance, is that it's sort of a story about the criminal like underworld feels a little like weird when it's kind of has this brightness to it and mm -hmm. this kind of like gloss to the whole thing. Yeah, um, I, I would say the thing that I like also about corporate is that th that darkness allows you to go a little surreal and so you get a different bag of tricks that kind of makes sense as well. Like you can get like a little more subjective with like the point of view a little bit, you know, like there's some dream sequences and stuff that you guys do. The camera moves can feel overt, but like in a more, uh, yeah, subjective sort of way. Like you're in the state of mind of like yeah. being, uh, overwhelmed by a corporate monotony yeah and i think part of that is like we just wanted to be able to make up our own rules and do whatever we wanted and be the sort of like god of our universe mm -hmm. in a way that i think uh i like to embrace because some some things in a more realistic view is like this is sort of just what happened it's <laughs> like no it's not it's all fake you're right. controlling <laughs> it all uh like a puppeteer so I, I like sort of just not being limited by that and feeling right. free to indulge or go into someone's head if it's, you know, motivated by story and, and just kind of have, have fun and show these different sides to it. So specifically, how did you represent that to the network and to each other even? You know, like, uh, at what point did people really understand, oh, this is what the show looks like? Is it a lookbook or is it arithmetic or is it just conversations or? I guess, well, or is it part of the pitch, right? Is that kind of what you're asking too? I guess that and then also like... What I'm really saying, I guess, is that, you know, when I'm pitching and talking to an executive or someone like that, I can tell them as, million, as many times as I want that it's going to be X, Y, and Z, but it isn't until they really see it that they get it, right? And your show is so specific looking that if they didn't know what they were buying and it was a surprise, <laughs> that could be a problem do you know what i mean yeah i mean i think we just tried to communicate it we didn't we had a lookbook but we never showed it it wasn't for comedy central it was just sort of for our cinematographer um was he involved at all in creating that look or did you kind of give it to him and he just made it well he had the kind of work. like specifics of how to execute the vague idea that we had and mm -hmm. i think the kind of lens choices and and the the kind of 
yeah, the, the technical side of it, he was able to fill in. I didn't know really how to like pull that off. Mm -hmm. Um, and the lighting too, I really left up to him and is not a thing I'm as, uh, strong at. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, and, and it was sort of, I think the key decision was hiring a person who had a track record of doing stuff that looked interesting that wasn't typical comedy mm -hmm. um, versus, because we also did interview um, cinematographers who had mostly done comedy or TV comedies. And it was like, well, should we tell them to do something different? Because in the interview, they all said, yeah, I can do something different. Yeah. It's They're like, like and maybe please they, let me, I want to. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they could have, but we did not give them the chance. <laughs> it's like, no, I don't believe you. Uh, but I think, yeah, making the kind of riskier choice of pick somebody who is has a different background mm -hmm. and and sort of trust them to bring their own kind of instincts uh to kind of mix in with our instincts which come from a different place right well what did you tell your dp did you say like we want it to look like a fincher movie was that uh, like in your references well yeah when we when we interviewed the cinematographer we he actually he created a lookbook brought it to us and there is an image in it that was also in our lookbook coincidentally uh, from cool. fight club and i was like oh okay this guy yeah yeah <laughs> is kind of that that's how he sees it and what um, image it was it was just a picture of edward norton when his like boss is talking to him in the office and he has a cigarette hanging out of his mouth and it's just mm -hmm. kind of turned making like a fuck you face to his boss right and you like that because of how it looked but also tonally it's that's like the, what the show is about yeah it was contrasty and the, his face kind of looked bad you know, it was like mm -hmm. perfect <laughs> he's been fighting people at that point but yeah. you're like it's like <laughs> hating your boss also yeah so is so when you're pitching this show like how aware or how worried are you about like the office or workaholics or these other shows that are about people working in a corporation like well, i think that's part of the reason too we felt like we needed a kind of strong different angle on the workplace comedy and i think people have uh responded to our show is that it's pretty like extreme and like it's sure, <laughs> darkness yeah. and it's tone um so but that all, it was i think actually an asset um as we were pitching it is that we have this different point of view and i think also a key part was the uh stuff that matt jake and i had made before and the women videos which have a very specific kind of point of view and a darker tone and sense of humor so i felt like they were able to see how we would make something different mm -hmm. than those people given everything we had done before so Sorry, go we're going way out of order here but can you just walk us through how you got the opportunity to pitch and then kind of what like your elevator pitch is for the show sure like, like what convinced comedy central to to get the pilot made yeah well we call it we sometimes say it's like office space meets american psycho <laughs> cool great cool. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah or if like david fincher directed the office <laughs> right uh so yeah i think we, we kind of led with the like darkness of it and um and did you get in there because they were familiar with the woman stuff uh i'd done like a lot of um stand-up when i first moved out to la and i met that's where i met Matt and Jake and the guys that I, I formed women with. Um, and so we'd made, we'd made a lot of stuff and on the side to those guys were all doing stand up. I stopped at a certain point doing stand up to focus on um, directing, but they were still kind of out there and on comedy central's radar. So yeah, I kind of found a community of people um, that got our foot in the door there. And yeah, Matt had a general meeting with comedy central where he loosely talked about the idea and they asked us to come in for a pitch. And it was, so it was the first place we pitched it. And oh, we cool. had, uh, yeah, just a like a two page treatment about Did it. Did you go in with an agent or anything? Uh, no, just was, the three of you guys. Yeah, just and you those. had two That's pages. That's kind of the magic <laughs> of of Comedy Central. It's like there's a few places where you can still kind of do that, you know, mm -hmm. and 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 because they've got a talent department basically like keeping track of who who's the up and coming stand up right now. Like they're the I I had heard. Jake's name in particular back when I was at Comedy Central that's probably like five years ago now just like oh people are tracking the people who are doing comedy right. you know what I mean like, yeah it's just like the way influencers of, how people track YouTube influencers in the digital the digital world like yeah you just like, like it's important to be aware of who whose voices are emerging basically yeah and that was uh, I feel like our sketch group women we never like went viral or nothing ever got mm -hmm. that many views but we became one of those people in LA or one of those groups in LA that was cool to know about. 
if, sure. you, if you worked in an agency or something, we became kind of like a... I call that Hollywood viral. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not about views, <laughs> but it's like, oh, you know, you, you get passed around a little bit. Yep. Yeah. And I think we did stuff that was kind of different than mm-hmm. what other people were doing. So we stood out. For, we were a cool thing to like for a second. Mm-hmm. And that was really helped us. And were you doing live stuff or like YouTube videos? Or? Pretty much exclusively video. Yeah. For YouTube, or were you doing Funnier Dice? Was that with women, or was that a separate? I worked stuff? at Funnier Dice separately as a <coughs> writer, director, editor. Uh, that was like the first job I had coming out to LA. I kind of snuck in the door as a. I was like, I'll oh, just back up the hard drives <laughs> <laughs> on the original Post side, or, or on the um, yeah on the on the original side for their yeah website. Um, and then, so that I was kind of doing two careers parallel to each other. Mm-hmm. One where I was kind of working at Funnier Die, making web videos, and then that eventually led into uh, some editing work for uh, the Birthday Boys on IFC and uh, some other stuff as well. But on the weekends and nights, I would go out and do stand up and shoot videos with women, which was sort of like at Funnier Die, the videos I made had to kind of like chase views or like. Mm-hmm be topical and right, right. try to go viral. And that's Sophia f- Vergara wants to do a funny video about the president. Yeah. You know, yeah. I guess that's <laughs> a, the, the current version of that. But yeah. make a sketch that people think is a sex tape when they click on it and then it's actually a comedy sketch. That was Got the funnier it. day. That's the yeah. best trick funnier day came up with. Uh, it really did work. <laughs> that's so depressing. <laughs> that's so but yeah, the um women vi- videos became the thing that we could just do whatever the fuck we wanted Mm -hmm. and like i wouldn't have to appeal to an internet audience specifically or kind of pander for views Mm -hmm. it was just like do whatever we want and that's the thing that ended up uh leading to things more directly Mm -hmm. is the the stuff i did for fun on the side but you were also like honing your skills at funnier day right yeah definitely yeah that's a good combo and so you get this general meeting or you or Jake has a general meeting. He tell, he soft pitches them corporate. And he says it's a show about people that work for a corporation. Yeah, I, I think, well, the the thing that a lot of people have related to the show is like Comedy Central executives work for Viacom. They worked at a giant sure. corporation. So the show is like relatable to them. And it was sort of like, uh, we want to like, show that it sucks to work in an office and not try to make it fun because it's a comedy TV show that people... Mm-hmm. Uh, are supposed to want to watch. <laughs> yeah, that's funny because I feel like the thing you would hear when I worked at Comedy Central is just like, oh, it must be so much fun and everyone must be so funny. Just laughing all the time. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's like everything else. Yeah, it does. It's like I'm still in a cube. It still smells like microwave pizza back there. You know, like... Um, I liked working in an office when I when I did it. Sorry, guys. Oh, yeah. But you worked at like a, like a young internet startup office. Yeah. I and, guess we didn't really have cubicles. Like yeah, I, had desks yeah. And yeah I had fun working at Funnier Die. I actually yeah. didn't have a bad corporate job <laughs> that makes me relate to the show. Did the other guys? Uh, Matt did, especially. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And they yeah. both had to work kind of day jobs. But we've all gotten like client notes, which are kind of the same as boss notes. Yeah. Right? In yeah. a way. Uh, They're less jargony, though. There yeah. is like the... I even... I'll still say like... I wouldn't say like put a pin in it, but like my email, <laughs> email writing is, is, I catch myself realizing like, oh, there is some jargon that I can't get out of my system. That's funny. Let's yeah. take this offline. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess there's a jargon. I guess even what you just said about like this, let's pretend like fool people into thinking this is a sex tape, but it's really a comedy tape is like, it's fun to see it work, but it's like also frustrating that you are mis leading people in order to watch your stuff right yeah like as opposed to what you really want to do which is you want to make people watch your stuff because it's good yeah just the conflict of like i need to make some money money (laughs) it's like (laughs) right that's the goal of a job versus like i want to do whatever i want right reasons Uh, yeah what's that that documentary is it called the corporation you guys see that Hmm. from years ago it's kind of about how the corporation and the american corporation has one goal and only one goal and that's like make money for the shareholders yeah at all expenses like everything else is secondary yeah um and it's not like a that's not like an evil conspiracy that's just like that's fact. literally yeah the what they're required to do yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and i think that's what we try to tap into in corporate to the idea that like there's not a like villain who's causing all this it's a system that everyone's trapped in mm-hmm. and i honestly don't even have a better idea for a better system so right i guess communism <laughs> or 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> can try uh, that. Fascism. So uh, <laughs> maybe there's a new thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's figure it out, guys. Tom, you got it right, right now. Um, so uh, okay, so so you you pitch uh, in the room, right? They're into it, and at this point, you've cut uh, a handful of things, right? Like you cut uh, all of the birthday boys um, and all of that, but you hadn't directed a television show yet, right? Was uh, there? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, no, not really. I'd done a lot of yeah, funnier die sketches, and some of them were kind of higher profile or mm-hmm. like I was able to cut a reel with a bunch of like kind of ce- celebrities or half celebrities in it. Sure, there <laughs> you a go. director's reel. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So was there ever a conversation of like, oh, is Pat the guy who's going to do all of this, or was there? Did anyone ever doubt you or anything? I'm sure there were those conversations. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was not involved in them. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky um, you. That's and you, Matt and Jake were like. A hundred percent on your side. Like, did you ever have that conversation with them? Sorry for putting you on the spot, but Matt and I have had this conversation with writers and co-writers millions of times, yeah. which is saying like, look, if they want to buy the show and you'll still get paid, but you won't get to direct. And you're still writing. Yeah. You know, yeah. You're you're still you'll creating, get a producer credit on it. But they don't, they want to bring in a hot shot. Yeah. The show might only <laughs> But Mick G is going to come in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Like, did that conversation never happen? It didn't come to that, no. Uh, yeah, and I th- I think it's because of all the stuff that we've done before mm-hmm. and that just having sort of a proof of concept. And I think the idea that Matt and Jake are the actors and I'm their friend who directs the sort of like, well, that's a package mm-hmm. that then we can control. Um, and I think, and then after... So that was just for the pilot too, and then they they really loved the pilot. So after that, it, sure, the kind of battle was won. Yeah, yeah. Um, when, once you're there and you see, and it's the pilot that aired, right? It's the one that's yeah. on TV now. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And like then the, then it's undeniable for sure. And yeah. is the pilot like way lower budget than the rest of the series, or like how how does that work? Do they give you like a certain amount of money, and or do they say, okay, go write a script, and then if we like the script, we'll let you shoot the pilot. And yeah, yeah. First, we wrote like an outline and, and script, and then uh, yeah, they liked that. And yeah, they have a lot of scripts that they never shoot. That's the main thing that happens. Sure. There. So it's like super traditional pilot season type of uh, workflow that you yeah. guys did. Yeah, pretty much. And uh, and I kind of liked it too. It was good to kind of like develop the show and then have a chance to like shoot it by just for one episode and try stuff out and like mm-hmm. kind of gather a crew and then. And then also be able to go, because I yeah I'm I'm someone who's always like written, directed, and edited something, or like the whole process of that, and learned about everything I've made kind of just at the last moment when it's done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like oh that's what I should have done. So it's it's nice to be able to go through the whole production and post production of a show right. for one episode before you sit down to write the rest of the episode and figure out what you're going to shoot. You have a prototype now. Yeah. Right? So what did you revise? What did you change? What did you learn from episode one for the rest of the season? Um, I mean, I think we, like pilots are tough because you have to cram so much into it. Every line has to be doing five things mm-hmm. for you. Um, so I think we tried to like just not be so on the nose with kind of the jokes we're making about the corporate world or that sort of thing, but to get into character more and expand out in that way. Um, and I think we sort of tried to think about like, let's limit locations or those sort of production minded things. but I don't know. I think we kind of just made it as hard as for ourselves as, as the pilot was in the end. Yeah. Cool. Well, great. It was worth it. Yeah. yeah. I saw the, the one of the scenes I saw on my hotel TV was where the guy from the leftovers. Lance Rick. Yeah. yeah. Him. He is like going over fonts with, I think yeah. Adam Listick or. Yeah. yeah. Adam. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just like cracked. I've told like 10 people about that, even though it's like, <laughs> I mean, I feel like I've seen font jokes before, but I don't know. It's just like so yeah. good. And like, it so just kept pan. going yeah. and going. And it's like, yeah, I, I, I was in Houston, which they, for some reason, all the sign makers in Houston use horrible fonts. <laughs> um, so I was, yeah. had fonts on the mind. So and we yeah. also, we figured out with Lance Reddick, the funniest thing is just to like, cause he has such like. Uh, gravitas and authority right. and everything to says just make him say silly stuff or like a problem <laughs> a small problem he can't fix sure that frustrates yeah. him and that's funny yeah, yeah. Like, papyrus <laughs> <laughs> try helvetica yeah um, that's really funny so how stressful is the casting when you're doing the pilot because it's gonna make or break the show right yeah there's a yeah a lot of things to creating the show i didn't realize how huge of a decision it was 
at the time because I'm used to making sketches where it's three minutes and then it's done sure, forever. Yeah. You're like, this and guy can't character. do it, so we'll use this guy. Yeah. All the characters die at the end of every sketch. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it is It is huge. Um, and a new process for me, too. And it was also the most like draining... Uh, casting thing or no just casting and like seeing 20 people read the same scene and having to wrap your head around emotionally it's this really person hard. yeah in trying to imagine them in the series in every scene just would like fucked with my head yeah and I, our casting director I was do you want to do like two hours today or i was like no do like three or four. sure like, but then after like two hours i was like oh my god who yeah. is i can't even remember any of these people yeah yeah um, i get genuinely super depressed after auditions yeah yeah did but, you do chemistry stuff too like to see if people work together or? yeah we did we we cast adam lustig uh kind of first because he and it was there were some really exciting moments in casting when uh People would bring stuff to life and, and see some really incredible actors. And so, we, yeah, we cast him and then we wanted to, um, we tested uh, Anne Dudek, who plays Kate, um, opposite him. And the the like second she walked into the room and I saw them like stand next to each other, it was like, oh, that's, that's it. Yeah. It's, it's, it, yeah, it's weird how kind of with your gut some of that stuff is um, yeah. and how, immediate, how immediately you can tell. Did you know Lustig beforehand? Uh, I no, I no, really never met him before. Oh man, oh, yeah, that yeah. guy's so ubiquitous. <laughs> he's my favorite. He, like, I think he's I've maybe probably, the funniest person I've met. He's an incredible actor too. He's so good. He's really. I'd say like ten separate times I've asked for random people for a recommendation for a funny actor, yeah. and like they like totally different people have sent me like his info. Yeah, and like, he's the most enthusiastic, best attitude person. Yeah, yeah. so good. He loved it. I feel like also. Um, just kind of as a lesson to being an actor, like being enthusiastic, being smart, being engaged, um, basically being well liked is kind of the secret to his success. Yeah. You know, like I think yeah, you so don't hear a bad word about him, right? Very positive, down for whatever, but also like knows his lines perfectly. Yeah. He's extremely yeah. professional. Yeah. Also seems like he gets it, you know? Yeah. Like he's fun. Yeah. And yeah, he'd been a fan of women and like our stuff for a long time. So he was. Uh, effusive when we first cool. <laughs> met with him and so excited to be part of the show. That's funny. I just kind of assumed that he was your buddy. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, well, he is now. Yeah. yeah that, that whole cast. <laughs> well, uh, Riddick, what's his name? Sorry. Lance Reddick. Lance Reddick. I, yeah. I don't know him from like the comedy world, but like a lot of the other people on your show, I was like, oh, I recognize like almost all these people. Yeah. It's a weird mix of um, stand up comedians who haven't done much acting before. And yeah, a, a lot Arna of people. Yeah. Uh, isn't in a ton of. Wasn't she in Crashing? St- Oh, yeah, she's, she's in crashing. Just That's now, right. she's yeah. really starting to be in everything. Yeah. Um, but Besides yeah. Twitter. Yeah. She's, Twitter, she's had for a while. <laughs> and we knew all these people from the LA comedy scene, too, who were stand ups who we featured as guest stars mm-hmm. in the show um, who haven't been on TV before. And it's cool, too. In, in our show, we didn't want to like cast anyone too famous or mm-hmm. recognizable because we really wanted you to like feel like you're part of this world. Um, and not be taken out of it mm-hmm. by celebrity cameos or any of that right, stuff. Right. And so yeah, we had but we had all these like talented people that we'd done stand up with for years to, that we knew could be hilarious and tried to feature them. Um, so it's a combination of those people and people like Lance Reddick, who is like uh, a real actor who yeah. I have to like. <laughs> right. Be, yeah. I have to do a really good job. Directly. Sure, sure. <laughs> do you That's get really self conscious sometimes? Like you're like I learned on funnier die shoots where. Uh, I was thrown with a so, like legitimately famous celebrity sometimes, and we only had one day to shoot like uh, way too much to just kind of stand up and be like, "All right, P Diddy, you gotta. I need you to stand over there, and I need you to say sure. this. <laughs> okay, do it again." <laughs> yeah. uh, and to sort of just be, it's like we just got to do this, um, yeah. and have that attitude of not. They being, there's no time that. to be self conscious. Yeah, I feel like that's, that's I do smart. think like when I did that thing with Will Arnett and Jimmy Kimmel. Like, they definitely listened to me, and I, you know, they're like, well, just tell us what you want us to do. But they also, like, were so into talking to each other that, like, I I mean, if I saw them again, like, the next day, I don't know that they would recognize me, you know? Yeah. Like, they, and I don't know about, like, the P. Diddy shoot, but when you only have these people for, like, an hour, it's exactly. like, they yeah. don't get to know you or anything. Yeah. It is, um... And I try to just find, it's like, hey, today we got to do this, 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 and this. Right. <laughs> and be the person to just kind of lead them through it, too. Because, yeah, I mean, that's, I, I feel like as a director, too, it's like, hey, everybody, it's like, I know what to do, and then we all get to go home. Mm-hmm. So listen to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and people right. will kind of sign up for that. That is great advice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and also, like, that also means um, 
I know when I can be on my phone and when I can't be. You yeah, know, like right. if you're P. Diddy, you've got other things to worry about, yeah. right? So like this guy's got me, I'm going to do my thing, but I also can like, you know, do the other 16 things that I need to be doing at that moment as well. Right. By the way, I think he has a new name. I think, isn't his name like Love or something? Mm, yeah. Anyway. So, apologies to P. Diddy <laughs> and to always P. Diddy. I know him as P. Diddy. Yeah, sure. So, that's... <laughs> um, so speaking of advice, we like to ask our guests when we have time and I'm going to try to sneak this in because we're running short. Um, like if you were, if somebody that's a new filmmaker that's just moving to LA or just graduating film school, like is looking at your career and wants to also have a TV show uh, on, you know, like you do, what advice would you give them? Uh, I think what really worked for me was finding communities of people and trying to explore um, that like I did took UCB classes when I came in here. I made stuff for Channel 101. Um, I did stand up, and I kind of found the people that I wanted to collaborate with, and who I could share a voice with, and whose skills um, could supplement mine, mm-hmm. and that we could kind of all benefit from something. Um, so yeah, I'd say try to find people um, that you want to work with, and that you can offer something to. Um, and I think yeah, just make your own stuff. Try to learn as many different skills as you can. Because I got into everything because I liked comedy writing. Mm -hmm. And then I found out how complicated (laughs) making uh, TV and movies is. Um, So I tried to learn everything I could, camera and sound and editing and all that stuff. And that really helped me find a job when be employable when I came out here because I, I I came out and said like I want to be a writer director editor and everyone was like well everyone wants to be a writer director but you want to be an editor okay here <laughs> sure. edit oh that's a good point yeah. yeah yeah and that it also has now really helped me uh, be able to control the quality of what I'm making now because I know about editing mm-hmm. and I didn't and especially too when you're making your own stuff if you uh, need people to work for free <laughs> it's hard to convince people. Uh, so if you can like edit everything yourself, sure. That's and, one less position to worry about. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it and puts, one less insanely important position. Yeah. And that, yeah. That. And I also think people get drawn into pursuing yeah, entertainment because they like one aspect of it, but you're better at, you'll be a better actor if you know about wardrobe and lighting and, and you'll be better at whatever your job is. If you know about what everybody else is doing and the importance of that and how, that can shape and add to what you're interested in. How important do you think it is to have a clear goal? Like, did you come to LA and say like, I want to have a comedy TV show? I probably, if you'd asked me, I probably would have said like a show on Comedy Central was <laughs> what <laughs> I wanted. So it worked out <laughs> well, but I, I did find myself like um, starting a career in editing for a while and that was, and I liked it too. And it, mm. I would, yeah, would it's have, a good job. Yeah. It yeah. could have worked out and um, I'm happier that I'm doing what I'm doing now. But I think, no, no, I think you should be flexible, and I think you should not have too set of an idea mm-hmm. of what you want, because it will change, I think, naturally. Am I allowed to ask how many years it took you from when you moved to L.A. to having the show? Uh, I moved here in 2010. We pitched it in 2015. <laughs> and oh, now, that's wow. great. That's good to know. Yeah. yeah, and now it's on the air in 2018. Yeah. So That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Over seven years. We, I always try to like kind of communicate how long things are, the, how long it takes to incubate things and how, yeah. you know, even getting an offer, you know, like negotiating contracts, shooting a pilot, waiting to hear back about whether or not you get the green light, then writing everything, then shooting everything, then finishing it, and then getting on the schedule. Yeah, it's a real nightmare. That's, <laughs> but also that five years of getting to a place where you have your community and you have... And people will take a meeting with you because yeah. you have something to offer. Yeah, that was really building momentum those first few years was, yeah. was big. Yeah. I would say that that's pretty fast, actually. You said so five years, basically, before you had sold a television show? That's very yeah. fast. To me, yeah. it's yeah. like, I feel like the usual thing is five years till you get that meeting and then like another five years till you <laughs> sell that show. Yeah. Um, but you got it on your first try, so that's yeah, awesome. I got, I got lucky. Yeah. Um, well, what are you doing? Anything else other than season two? Um, hopefully, season two. Um, no, this has pretty much absorbed my life right now. I'm, I've got some uh, scripts and concepts that I'm like working on, and will hope to make after this. But uh, yeah, for the moment, 
focused on corporate. Do you have like reps like that you got from this or that you had before this that are like, give us more pitches? Uh, yeah, I've got, uh, yeah, got reps a few years ago, kind of through, basically through women was mm-hmm. how I got into the radar of, um, uh, the agencies and stuff. And, um, so yeah, now I have, I'm at WME and, uh, but they, I've told them like, I need to make <laughs> corporate and, and because I'm involved in every phase of it and, and that's what I like doing too. I that's what I most prefer to do is like be the person who sees who is there when we came up with the joke and mm-hmm. is there and like the sound mixed when we're adjusting the level of the line delivery. Um, so I like being very hands on and I'll always I think choose that like being involved in something start to finish instead of like having my hands in five different things at mm-hmm. at once. I like to be able to totally focus on something. Yeah, right. I had that being with, a control freak. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was having coffee with. Uh, Charles Hood, previous guest of Night Owls, and he made the point like you kind of only get to make twelve or fifteen things if you're lucky, you know, like a movie or a season of TV. Like you don't get to make that much stuff. So like wanting it to be good makes sense, right? Yeah. yeah. It also yeah it frustrates me when a TV show or something is on the air for a while, and then like the creator or the main like writer goes off and does something else and then sure. the show feels phoned in. It's like, yeah. dude, I'm watching this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing I realized from just scaling up to this level of production is there's like so many people on set mm-hmm. and there's like, there's extension cords like wrapped around the whole building to a generator <laughs> that somebody got there at 5 a.m. Sure. And says like little elves in the night. And yeah. it's like, wow, I need to like, do a good job <laughs> because all these people, <laughs> yeah, yeah, some all these people moved are, all the way from Ohio to yeah. like sit next to this generator. I'm got to do a lot of responsibility. Yeah. I feel like yeah. as, if you're creatively in charge of something, like I want it, I want to give it a hundred percent. I'd feel terrible if I yeah. like didn't try my hardest because yeah. everybody else is like showing up in telling their parents that they worked on this cool show. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's all you care about, Matt. Is telling your parents you well, worked on a cool show. I mean, like you know, you want to be able to say like, "Oh, this is the thing that I have been working on for <laughs> years and can't talk to you on the phone for." You know, like there's a lot of sacrifices you make to make art like this. You know, so yeah. like being able to make sure that everybody is proud of it in a specific way or in any way. You know, the way that they want to express it is yeah. important. So yeah. I, well, yeah. also, I was gonna say one kind of like mantra we had. At the start, I was telling people, everyone we like interviewed and wanted to work with was like, we want to make something great. Like, we yeah, want to yeah. try really hard. We just started saying, like, it's going to be a lot of work. <laughs> uh, but also, people got on board and were kind of like, and it too, because we, a lot of our crew was from uh, the commercial world mm-hmm. um, and had a made a TV show before. This was sort of pitched as like an opportunity to do something fun and narrative and that you'll really like and want to watch again and be proud of. And people, that, telling people that really, I think was was huge uh, and motivated people to work harder and to take pride and ownership in it. And that was, I think, a key thing that we uh, did yeah. that really paid off. Yeah, especially in a, such a technical show, you really need a lot of people dialed in. Yeah. Cool. You also pay them decently, I assume. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, I was going to say about the parents, you always want to tell your parents because they're the only ones that like haven't cut the cord yet. So they can actually like turn on the TV <laughs> and and watch what you made. Um, so awesome. Well, so how can we follow you? Like, are you on social media? Do you have any? Yeah. How, how oh. can listeners learn more about you? Uh, I've got a website called terribletown.com. And that's also my, my Twitter handle at terribletown. Was that a Channel 101 show? Uh, no. It just sounds like it. <laughs> it is a great name for a Channel 101 show. Just a moniker I stole from a field recording in an obscure song. Gotcha. In college. Uh, <laughs> that I've now used as my brand. <laughs> nice. Um, uh, cool. And so I guess, yeah, people terrible should check that out. And they yeah, can watch corporate, corporate. Yeah, please watch Corporate. On Comedy Central. Wednesdays at 10 p.m. After this podcast comes out, there will be more episodes to see. Yeah, and you can watch them online, I'm sure. Yeah, just torrent them on the Pirate Bay. <laughs> you can buy them for a reasonable amount of money on iTunes or Amazon. <laughs> and I'm sure Hulu. Can you watch them on Hulu? Uh, that, I think there's a delayed yeah. later thing. They'll yeah. Be on Hulu. Yeah, I would have normally I, for Comedy Central stuff. I would wait and then watch it all on Hulu. But I was like, well, we're doing this interview, and I like the show so much. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah. Matt's gone full on corporate. I did. I did. 
Yeah. Before we finish, we're going to talk about some things that we like. Unpaid endorsements. Do you guys have anything? I do have something. Yeah, I, I can kick it off. Okay. Um, so uh, my wife for Christmas got me the board, the the thing board game, the thing uh, infection on Outpost Thirty One after John Carpenter's The Thing. Um, you guys know Mondo? It's like that art kind of um, gallery sort of space that they do like cool posters and like um it's like gallery 88 basically but in austin and i think associated with the alamo draft house anyway this is their board game so it's real cool looking um on top of being a super fun game and uh basically it's like um you know you're in the the outpost and you know one player is secretly the thing the imitation and you're trying to um figure out who that person is and uh, it's real Is that fun, like mafia, kind of, kind of like mafia, but uh, but with a little bit more of a board game element. So it's it's a social deduction game like mafia, but then you also have team based sort of um, missions that you have to carry out as well. So you'll have to um, you know you draw a card and it's like uh oh there's a fire in the you know storeroom or something like that, and so um, there's an extra layer of uh, gameplay on top of it. It's a little complicated. I would recommend if you uh, are having people over, watch a, like a YouTube tutorial on how to play it beforehand. Uh, but it was super fun and like um, combines like nerdy board gamery with some kind of more social elements as well. It was really great. Complicated fun with social elements. All right. <laughs> That's cool. And what you said, it's social deduction. Is that yeah, the social deduction is like that category of like mafia or werewolf oh. or like you're trying to figure out right. if someone's lying or not. Yeah, I just played Sudoku on the my Southwest flight. I was like uh-huh. really trying to not buy the Wi-Fi, <laughs> and they have like two games you can play on like your on the network. <laughs> And uh, I guess that's like a mathematical deduction game, right? It's oh, like the yeah, same, that's right. The same yeah. thing. It's like, well, it can't pre- be this and it can't be this. I got pretty deep into Sudoku in uh, high school. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of fun. Yeah, I mean, great. especially I when like you're it. trying to kill time. Yeah, yeah, sure. It does. Uh, it takes like 45 minutes to do one. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not as fun <laughs> as well. reading the news <laughs> if you can't do that. Yeah. Uh, Pat, you got something? Uh, yeah, and this is uh, probably doesn't need any help because it seems like it's pretty ubiquitous throughout Los Angeles, but I have to... Say sure. I'm basically addicted to LaCroix. Sure. The sparkling <laughs> water. I see you have an off brand sparkling I have, water. I have the that. Albertsons brand LaCroix. Yeah. So I want to personally to you uh, <laughs> sure. ask you to drink LaCroix. It's it's because what it is, it's it's nothingness. <laughs> it's just bubbly nothing. But I what I've realized from sitting in uh just working or sitting in an office all day is that I need to consume something Mm -hmm. and it literally doesn't matter what it is. Mm -hmm. Like I used to drink like eight cups of coffee a day, but not because I needed caffeine at all, just because I needed to put liquid into my mouth. And water didn't work. Water's Uh, too boring. Yeah, water's too boring. I need something exciting. a little something. (laughs) But the the least amount of exciting. I think that's like what people used to call smoking, right? Yeah. (laughs) Like you just smoke to... To do something, it is. Right? It's With a your, habitual. It's like, it breaks up the day. Yeah, yeah and it's like way. a stress reliever in a way, right? I, I have yeah. a friend who is. Um, it's January, so he's doing one of those like trendy. He's doing the whole thirty, which is like a cleanse where you don't eat anything or whatever. Full disclaimer: Matt's also Ooh. doing some. I'm doing cleanse. both the quantum, quantum <laughs> wellness cleanse and the whole life challenge. <laughs> Wow. So, you're going to be amazing pretty soon. <laughs> I'm rather proud of myself for never having heard of this. Uh, yeah, fair enough. Uh, but the point is, is he was like at a party and finally was like, I get LaCroix now. Like, oh, you just... Everyone feel, has that moment. You feel awkward and you're like, I'm not drinking beer, but I need to, to do something with my yeah. hands. And he was like, yeah, I drink four one night. I had no yeah. idea. And I stopped drinking Shirley Temples when I discovered LaCroix. <laughs> yeah, I just drink LaCroix and eat Altoids. That's the other thing. That is just like oh. nothingness. Are you allowed to eat cycle. unlimited ones of those? I don't know. Is that bad? Does it give you tummy problems? Well, I was just with someone uh, on this project and he had a cough. and he So he had a bag of like Hall's cough drops, like a hundred of them or something. And during our casting, it was a long casting, like six hours or something. He ate like the entire bag almost. And I was like... <laughs> I'm pretty sure you can only have two of those a day, <laughs> yeah, or at least every four hours. And he's like, "No, I don't think there's a limit." And then he's like, 
<laughs> we looked at the bag and it's like, oh yeah, you're gonna die. <laughs> also, like you're never, you'll never cough again. <laughs> even if it it was okay to do that, you're still eating like a bag of candy, yeah. right? Like those halls are just like. But is it? Aren't they? Do they have calories? Is it sugar? Yeah. Or is it like? Yeah, it's definitely sweetener. sugar, right? Yeah, right. But it like it Arricola? lasts for a while. That's yeah, what that's it, true. You can yeah, do it. but. My dad got a kidney stone from eating calcium tums. Oh, really? <laughs> Habitually. So, oh. yeah. yeah. So that's an unendorsement. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's wow. funny. I think my dad probably did the same. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys afraid, as afraid of kidney stones as I am? Yeah. Uh, I assume so. Assuming you're afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not at all because I'm a man. <laughs> yeah. Like, is there something I should be drinking to prevent them? Water. Like acid? Don't, yeah. don't consume any calcium. That's, <laughs> oh, let man. your bones be brittle. <laughs> I think but hydration no. is a big yeah. part of it, actually. Okay. Yeah. The, the other, so, the, LaCroix. There you go. The last thing I'll say about LaCroix is I do probably <laughs> think we'll find out it, it's going to give us cancer. Uh, yeah, I think it's supposed sure. to be bad for your teeth, actually, okay. or your bones. There must yeah. be something. It's... Yeah, there's got to be a catch. About it. It's like diet soda. It's yeah. like, why is it zero calories? And about six months ago, they found out, I think most of America found out that LaCroix was not French. So that's oh. also Yeah, wait, pretty, where is it from? It's like from Indiana or something oh. crazy well, like that. I'm going to believe what I want to believe. Sure. Yeah. Well, if you thought it was French, wouldn't you think it was La Croix? <laughs> yeah. So there was not, a long debate in, in our writer's room if it was La Croix or La Croix. It I is mean, LaCroix. It's LaCroix. Because yeah. it's rhymes with enjoy. Mm -hmm. But it's like from LaCroix, Indiana. It's like a, I mean, it might be a French so a spelling. So there's a French person involved somewhere. Well, also like St. Croix, right? You you don't say St. Croix. Do you? You should, uh, though. Oh, maybe you should. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's um, like Versailles, Kentucky. It always makes me laugh. Yeah. Paris, <laughs> Texas. Come on. Yeah. It's Paris. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, cool. Well, my endorsement is a, uh, so I was just on this shoot and we had Bryce Morgan on our podcast last week, and she was talking about how she like loves the handheld monitor. Mm -hmm. You know, as a director, and uh, kind of based on what uh, what Pat was saying here, like when you have this big crew, you see all these people are working for you, and everyone like you show up to set at eight a.m. and there's been someone there since five a.m. that's already run cables and everything, and you kind of feel, at least for years, I've kind of been feeling like, well, these people already set things up the way they like to set them up. I don't want to bug them, but I guess my endorsement is to like. Even if something is done the same way for many years and this is how each department does it, like don't be afraid to say, hey, I know that's what you guys are used to doing, but this is what I like to do. So there's two things I did on this last shoot, which I've never done before, but I just like insisted, which one I was like, hey, I want a handheld monitor too. Like why does only Bryce get that, you know? Um, and it was awesome. I never used it. I just oh, really? the monitor. <laughs> no, I oh, used yeah. it a little bit. I like when we, we were shot in this attic and I was... Whenever I was like in a cramped spot, or if I was like talking to the client, I would like yeah. carry my monitor over and, and you like can point show at them. something. Yeah, but I they had don't like, like it with two monitor. two cameras. Makes a handheld monitor kind of cumbersome because oh, you, yeah. can, you can get two side by side, or you can get one that switches back and forth, but it's not not as elegant. Yeah, but, but I kind of single cam. It's nice, you know. Yeah, it it was cool. I, I enjoyed having it, but um, you also I'm always have to like put it down somewhere, yeah, yeah. and I'm like, where's my monitor? <laughs> but uh, in the bathroom, um, but. Uh, I just really kind of appreciated that I said to like the DP, I was like, hey, can I have this handheld monitor? And then he asked the producer and they're like, yeah, sure. Like, <laughs> like I would have always liked to have one, but I never thought that I should ask for one. Learning to ask for things. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing is I told the, uh, on our, this shoot, the video playback guy was the guy that was also setting up Video Village for the client. And he was always setting it up with the clients like facing away from set. Mm -hmm. I think in his mind, it's like if they're talking, we're less likely to hear it or something. But I was like, I just don't ever do that. Like always put the monitor in the, like always have the people sitting. So where they're facing, if they look past the monitor, they would see the set. Mm -hmm. Don't have people facing away from set. It's weird for the actors. <laughs> it's weird for people that are trying to yell at stuff. And it, I don't know, it's just like. It's I don't, weird. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I'm not like a big um, feng shui guy, but it seems like bad feng shui to me. Also, if you run from set over to them, they don't they see you. They see you coming if if they're pointed at the set. You, right, right. If they're pointed yeah. at the set, you can wave to them. You can say like, "What do you guys think?" Like, there's a yeah. connection that you're like, and I know. Yeah, you can do thumbs up, question, like head tilt, and they can give thumbs up back. Right. So my endorsement is like, even if you are not the most experienced person on set, like, feel free to say like, "Hey, this is what I like," because this is when I shot with Just my two friends in my apartment. Around. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not, no, you don't have to be mean about it, but just, um, just like kind of trust your instincts, which is, I know, something people talk about all the time. But, um, but it's not, yeah, it's fine to have don't a, be afraid to trust your instincts. It's fine to have a new idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, cool. Well, so uh, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, this was thanks, great. Guys. Yeah. Thanks for the show. Corporate uh, Wednesdays, Comedy Central. Yeah, you can um, find out more about uh, Pat on his social media, Terrible Town, but we'll also put it in our show notes on our website, justshootitpod.com. And you can also email us at justshootitpod at gmail.com. We love questions, comments. We uh, we also have a Twitter, Just Shoot It Pod, Instagram, Facebook, Facebook the whole thing. Um, leave us an iTunes review. That's a big, big up for us. Um, we guys have been leaving some great ones lately, so thank you. Um, and you can follow me at Mr. Matt Enlo. And me at Smitey Pileg. This episode was edited by Christopher Robert Gray. Uh, and uh, our webmaster is Ewan Williams. And the music was provided by the Free Music Archive and the artist Jazar. Catch you next time. Bye.